Let's pause for a word of prayer. Lord God, we are so thankful that you touched our lives with the life of your son. We are so thankful that you brought someone into our lives, across our path. Someone at school or work, someone at church, some friend, perhaps even a stranger. Someone who is willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with us. And because that person touched our lives, we have had the opportunity to come to faith. And our God, you now give us that responsibility to be reconcilers in the world. To share that same information, that same message with those with whom we come into contact. And we would ask that during this hour that your Holy Spirit would come upon us in a very special way that we would know exactly what it is you are calling us to do. May your Holy Spirit have his perfect will accomplished in our lives. May we not leave here this morning thinking that the message was for someone else. But may we hear what you, God, have to say to us. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs> Many years ago, when I was a student at Dallas Seminary, I had the opportunity of working at WFA, WFA TV as a cameraman. And along with that opportunity came the opportunity to meet a number of celebrities that would come through Dallas and would stop there at the TV station. On one occasion, as I was going to go get a cup of coffee in one of the rooms, we had these swinging doors, and I went swinging out, pushing the door, and I hit somebody on the other side, and I saw a coffee cup go up in the air, and the coffee comes splashing down. And the first thing I did was, you know, apologize, and I looked up and saw the eyes of an individual that I knew him by voice. I had heard him many times on the radio, and I had seen his picture a number of times, and I was waiting for him to say, uh, this is Paul Harvey. Good day. <laughs> Harvey, I was so embarrassed that I apologized and told him I, you know, I didn't mean it, and he just looked down and smiled at me and said, oh, that's fine, don't worry about it, and brushed himself off as the coffee was dripping off of him. And then I told him that I was a student at Dallas Seminary, and he said, oh, I know all about that seminary, and then he began to share his own faith with me, his faith in Jesus Christ, and then he invited me up to the radio room where he was going to sit down and uh, do one of his uh, weekly broadcast or daily broadcast and so he invited me and another friend and we sat there and here was my idol Paul Harvey doing a radio broadcast I was sitting in that studio with him and another fellow well as he went through the various events of the day he ended with that great and that famous phrase this is Paul Harvey good day and ever since that time I was a became even a more of an admirer of his a, a great and when I would listen to him, the thing I liked probably more than anything else is when he would tell a story. And as he would tell a story, right before he was into the break, he would say, and now, the rest of the story. And I loved to hear the rest of the story because there was always some kind of a catch there. And I couldn't wait until that commercial was over so I could hear what the rest of the story was all about. <coughs> Well, that's what I want to tell you about this morning, because last week we looked at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28. We read about what Jesus Christ was doing. We read about the mandate that he had given to his disciples. And now this morning I want you to hear the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 1. In fact, the writer of the book of Acts is Dr. Luke. And as a background to what I want to say, he opens up his book and he says, In my former book, the office, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. In my former book, the office, what was that former book? That former book was the Gospel of Luke. It says, in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. What did the Lord Jesus Christ begin to do and to teach? He began to make disciples. He called twelve unto himself. 
He spent three years building into the lives of these men. They were his disciples. That's when he started. Because he came into this world to save those who were lost. And that is the beginning of discipleship. Bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. And now the rest of the story is recorded in the book of Acts. Jesus started to make disciples. He built the lives of 12 men over a period of three years. And then he sent his Holy Spirit and through these men and through others, through the church of Jesus Christ, he continues today what he began when he was here in this earth. But I couldn't think of a more motley crew to give a mandate to than these 12 men. I mean, these men were continually arguing who was the greatest in the kingdom. These 12 men couldn't understand what it was that Jesus was talking about half the time. All they heard his words, but they didn't understand exactly what it was he was telling. He told them on many occasions that he was going to be taken, that he would be crucified, that he would be rejected. And these men basically nodded their heads and said, we understand, Lord, we understand all about that. But they didn't understand. He said that the man, the Son of Man will also be raised from the dead the third day. They could shake their head, yes, they understood what he was talking about, but they didn't understand. And yet it was to these twelve men that Jesus gave the mandate, make disciples of all nations. Now how in the world were they going to carry that out? That's the rest of the story. First of all, they were going to carry it out with power from the high. If you look at verse 4 through 7, we see the power to make disciples. Can I do it? Can you make a disciple? Yes, you can. You say, where do I do it? How do I do this? Can I really do it? Yes, you can. You can do it not because of who you are, not because of your education or lack of it, not because of your experience or lack of it. You can do it because of who God is. We are told in verse 4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. The very first thing Jesus told these disciples to do, after he was raised from the dead, after their hopes were dashed concerning a kingdom on earth, after they saw their king be crucified and buried, but then they saw him be raised again, they saw him in his new resurrection body. After all of this, he tells them to wait. You see, at this point, the disciples are ready to do something. At this point, the disciples recognize that Jesus is alive and he has something special that's going to take place. Perhaps this is the time that he's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Perhaps this is the time when they will be able to sit on those thrones and rule over the nation of Israel and rule over the world. Perhaps this is the time. Well, what does Jesus tell them to do? Jesus says, wait. And so these disciples literally went into a waiting room. They went into the upper room. They spent days up there praying and waiting upon God to see what God's next step was for them. I know some of you right now are in God's week. Some of you right now are waiting to see what God has for you to do. Some of you have some decisions to make. And you don't know what decision it is that you should make. And you're waiting upon God to help you make that decision. Some of you are waiting upon God for some hope. Some kind of a word that will give you hope for the future. Some of you are waiting upon the Lord to provide for your financial needs. Some of you are waiting upon the Lord to bring back a loved one, a friend, a child, a relative who has strayed away from the faith. And you're praying, and you're waiting. And God's message to you today is, wait. Continue to wait. I am working in the life of that person. I am working in your life. I am working in the circumstances. That you need to wait. And these disciples, even though at this time they thought something special was going to take place, God says, wait. What are they waiting for? Wait for the gift that was promised by the Father. Jesus says, the gift that I told you about before. 
When did Jesus Christ talk about this gift that the Father was going to send? If you remember the upper room discourse in John chapter 14 and chapter 15 and chapter 16, he talked on, said several times about the Holy Spirit who was the counselor, the Holy Spirit who was a comforter, the Holy Spirit who was going to instruct them in the truth, who was going to bring to their remembrance the things that they had seen and the things that they had heard. The Holy Spirit was going to bring focus from all the things that, that they had lived with for those last three years, suddenly they were going to come into focus. And this would happen through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This comforter. This comforter. This helper. He says, I've already told you about this Holy Spirit. He says, so wait. Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to place you into the body of Jesus Christ. He's going to identify you with Jesus Christ. He's going to come upon you with, with a force that you've never experienced before in your life. He's going to bring you into a new relationship. He's going to begin something totally new that has never existed up to this point. So you wait for him. Notice their response. Verse 6, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's interesting where their mind was. Their mind was not on what Jesus was about to do. They wanted to know, is this the time? The time that we've been waiting for? The time we expected? The time we've prayed about? The time that we will be sitting there in the kingdom with you? Is this the time? And so often, we are out of sync with God's time. So often there are things that we want to do, and we want to do them right away. There are results that we would like to have accomplished immediately, if not sooner. And God says, this isn't the time for that. Our timing and God's timing so often do not synchronize. And this recently we had an experience about time. For over two years, we had not seen our younger son. He lives in Portland. We've heard me talk about him many times. But we knew that he was going to come here because he was looking at Dallas Seminary. His plan on coming to Dallas Seminary was June. And so we made plans for him to come. He told us when he was coming. We wrote it down. So we were expecting him to come. The service of people that he was coming, I said, pray about it. As he comes, he goes to the seminary. So we're expecting him to come. And we're waiting. We're waiting for the day of time. And that day is to be next Friday. We're excited about our son coming next Friday. And as we're making plans for him to come next Friday, my wife has an opportunity to go to Clark. But she said, well, we'll set it up where I will go to Florida on Monday, and I'll be back next Tuesday, and then Stephen will come in on Friday. So everything will be all prepared for. Him. Friday night, I was out with our other son and daughter in law. About 10 15, I came back to the house, walked into the house, the phone rang. It's my wife, Laura, talking to her on the phone. All of a sudden, I hear a click on the phone. I know there's a call coming in, so I said, hold on, honey, I'll be right back to you. I Looked at him, heard this voice. Hi, Dad. He said, Oh, Stephen, how are you doing? Oh, fine. Well, what's going on? Oh, well, just sitting there waiting for you. He said, uh, What are you waiting for? He was waiting for you to pick me up at the airport. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on, Stephen, get off it. You're not at there. What airport are you at? You have W. I said, you can't be there. You're not coming until next Friday. <laughs> Dad, I'm here. I'm waiting for you. I've been here for a half an hour. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. How could this happen? Anyway, I hopped in the car and walked to pick him up. Stephen, welcome to the North <laughs> <laughs> His timing, he was 
gone according to his time. He knew the exact time he was going to be here. He had no question about his time. We knew the exact time he was going to be here. We had no question about our timing. It's just that our timing was not synchronized. We still know what happened, but the timing is not synchronized. Let me tell you, friend, when Jesus Christ came here the very first time, his timing and the timing of the world was not synchronized. The Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, who was born of a woman. And when Jesus Christ came the first time, thousands upon thousands of people never recognized him, never accepted him. In fact, they rejected him because it was not time for him to show up. Oh, they knew he was coming. They had their own timetable. They had their own expectation. But when he arrived in his timetable, most of the people did not recognize him. He came on his own, and his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, who then he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Let me tell you something else. According to the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back another time. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and take his church to be with himself. And there are those who say, oh, I believe that, and I know he's coming, but certainly he's not going to come now. He probably won't come for a long time. We don't know when he's going to come. We don't know the exact time. But I guarantee that there are going to be people who are eating and drinking and just going about their daily routine as though he's never going to show up. And he's going to show up. And they're not going to be wrong. These disciples were asking the question, Lord, is this the time you're going to set up that game? Lord said, no. Not this time. I have another plan. I have something else that I'm going to do. This is not the time for the kingdom. He responds and explains in verse 7, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. You realize that the time for Jesus coming into the air for his church has already been set by God? You realize that it's in his timetable, it is on his chart, it is on his schedule. He knows exactly when he's going to come back. Now he's not going to prolong it. He's not going to change his mind. The Bible says it is set. And so we are in a countdown for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it could be before I'm finished speaking, it could be tomorrow, it could be 20 years from now, it could be 100 years from now, but there's going to be a time when God says, this is it. And I'm coming back for those who belong to me. Are you going to be ready at that moment? Is your life straightened out with God where you will be ready when Jesus Christ returns? Have you placed personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ where you have no doubt that when he comes back he's going to take you to be with himself? Friend, if you don't, now is the day of salvation. Now is your accepted time. Now is your time to turn away from sin and to turn to God by placing your faith in Christ and inviting him to become your personal savior. This is your time to make that kind of decision. Because the time has been set by the Father. <laughs> Notice, the Lord answers another question. First of all, can I do it? Yes, you can do it because I'm going to send the Spirit of God. The next question, how will I do it? Here's the plan. Here's how you do it. Verse 8, it's going to be a twofold plan. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. First of, you, first of all, you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ unless we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You say, well, wait a minute, I can tell people about the gospel. I can tell people what happened to me. I can, I can do a lot of things without the Holy Spirit. You cannot bear the Spirit of truth without the Holy Spirit. Why do you need power? The same reason I need power. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God as I prepare my messages. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God as I deliver my messages. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God as I seek discernment and wisdom as I'm reading the Word of God. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God so I have the confidence 
and the boldness to stand before you week after week and declare the good news of Jesus Christ. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God so that when I experience discouragements, when I experience the down times in my life, I know that His sustaining power is right there. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God just on a one-to-one -one relationship. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God to love, to show compassion, to encourage. I need to be empowered by the Spirit of God to do the things I don't want to do. And there are many times there are things I don't want to do, but I know I need to do. The only way I'll ever do it is to be empowered by the Spirit of God. I look at the disciples. Why do they need to be empowered by the Spirit of God? Look at chapter 2 of the book of Acts, verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. <coughs> These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Here is Peter who needed the power, needed the enablement of the Spirit of God to stand before the people who crucified Jesus Christ. And he stood there and told them to repent of their sins. Now that takes a lot of enablement. Because the same Peter denied the Lord three times. The same Peter ran away from God before the Spirit of God came upon him. These same disciples ran away from the Lord Jesus Christ when the Lord needed them most. But here are these disciples standing there with Peter saying, Amen. Preach it, brother. Where did they get that confidence? Where did they get that boldness? They were enabled by the Spirit of God to proclaim the truth of God to people who needed to hear it, to repent. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Peter and the other disciples needed the Spirit of God, needed to be empowered by the Spirit of God for what? To experience spiritual resource. Verse 40, we read, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Tremendous revival took place. 3,000 people in one day come to faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because Peter was a great preacher? No. Because Peter, enabled by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the word, the Spirit of God took the word, penetrated the hearts and the minds and the lives and the wills of those people who heard, so that those people repented of their sin and turned to Jesus Christ. Spiritual results are produced by the Holy Spirit and not by man. When man persuades a man, you don't end up with spiritual results, you end up with man-made results. But when the Holy Spirit persuades a man, that's when you see spiritual results take place. We read later on, in Acts chapter 5, they needed power, they needed enablement. Acts chapter 4, the last part of verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Why did they need the Holy Spirit? They needed the Holy Spirit to remove selfishness. They needed the Holy Spirit to remove self-centeredness. They needed the Holy Spirit to give them such love for one another that they were willing to share their physical possessions. They were willing to let loose. They were willing to give away. And it's the Holy Spirit who united them together. <laughs> Friend, the only time that we're going to experience great generous, generosity in our hearts is when we are enabled by the Holy Spirit to do so. Jesus said, you wait 
the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And when he comes upon you, he will come upon you with great power. And then he goes on to say, and you will be my witnesses. Actually, they were his witnesses. Luke chapter 24, he tells them, he says, you are my witnesses. You are witnesses of these things. What is a witness? A witness is a person who has seen something, who has heard something, who has experienced something. You go outside and you see some cars coming together and crashing out here on the Northwest Highway. You are a witness. Why are you a witness? Because you saw it. You heard it. You were there. So you were a witness. You say, I don't want to be a witness. Friend, that's not an option. You are a witness. And if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a witness of the forgiveness of your sins. You are a witness to a life change that has taken place within you. You are a witness to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So God doesn't ask us to volunteer to be his witnesses. He says, I want to inform you that you are witnesses, you are my witnesses. Now, the Bible speaks a lot about false witnesses. It condemns false witnesses. But the Bible also condemns witnesses who don't witness. The scriptures. God spoke to Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, I'm sending you to this nation. Here's a message I want you to give to them. Now, if you give them that message and they don't respond, I will not require the blood of your hand. I will require from them. However, if you fail to give them that message and they perish, then I will require from you. Because you failed to warn me. The way you go. It's a tragedy that today, in the prisons across this country, there are people sitting in prison who are innocent because witnesses fail to witness. Because witnesses were intimidated, because witnesses were fearful, because witnesses did not want to get involved, you have people sitting in prison today, totally innocent, And the people who saw it, the people who knew it, the people who heard it, the people who were there would not come to the front and bear witness of what happened. And I believe there are also people who are sitting in hell today because there are Christians who are witnesses for Jesus Christ who have failed to bear testimony, who have failed to warn them that they were going in the wrong direction, who failed to give them the message that there is another way and that is the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ. You and I do not have an option whether or not we will be a witness. We just have the option what kind of a witness we're going to be. We can be a silent witness, or we can be a witness that will declare the claims of Jesus Christ in the way of salvation. Jesus said, you're a witness. I walk with this. That's the word is that. Say, well, how do you witness? Well, first of all, you live it. What you say you believe, you live it. Is there anything in your life that is different than the lives of the people with whom you work? Is there anything in your life, in your language, in your attitude, in your work habits, in your relationship with people? Is there anything? That would attract people to you to find out more of what it is that makes you think. You begin the witness by just living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And allow the Holy Spirit to begin to attract and to open the eyes of people around you to see that you are genuine. Secondly, you share. What do I mean by sharing? Well, you yes, have something exciting some exciting news, you can't keep it to yourself, you want to share it. Sometimes we go on gossip. You don't want to go, guess what happened? Guess what I heard? i got to share this with you. <coughs> Friend, we 
share all kinds of things we should never share, and what we should share, we fail to share. God says, I have a message, I have a life, and I want you to share it. Just let people know what it is that's different about you. Thirdly, teaching. Instruct others, whether it's in a group or one-on-one. -on -one. Teach. Tell people who Jesus is, what he can do for them. Jesus is the one who said, I will make you fishers of men. Now, there are two different kinds of fishermen. There are fishermen who go out to put the line in, but they go out because they enjoy the surroundings. They like the water, they like the fresh air. They're not planning on catching anything, they're just going out to fish. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's the kind of fisherman you are, that's fine. You just like to get out in the fresh air and fish. You have to catch something, so that makes it a little bit nicer. You don't have to, have to catch it, no problem. Human fish. There are others who go out and they want to catch fish. And so they go where the fish are. They don't just go to any body of water and throw something in there and hope that something's going to come by and bite. They go where they know that they've been biting. And when you and I are fishing for people, we realize that not everyone's going to bite. Not everyone's going to respond. But we go to those whom we are observing that the Holy Spirit is already at work in their lives. They may have had a tragedy in their life. They may be up against a very difficult situation. They need someone to come along the side to encourage them, to pray with them. This person is ready to hear a little bit more about God. You are my witness. Can I do it? Yes, you can. How do I do it? You do it by being empowered by the Spirit of God and by bearing witness to what God has done in your life. Thirdly, where do I do it? Where do I begin to make this life? He points out, you begin in Jerusalem, you go into Judea, Samaria, into the ends of the earth. I broke this down into three worlds. Your personal world, that's your Jerusalem. That is your family. That is your church. That is the people that you know, you live with, you work with. That is, th these are the people out there in the workforce. These are the people that you go to school with. People who know you, people who you know. That's your personal world of influence. That's where you begin to be a witness. Friend, witnessing begins in the home. What a tragedy to hear of time after time of people who want to serve the Lord and, and they love the Lord. And they tell everybody else about Jesus Christ and they miss their family. They neglect their family. They're so busy being involved for the Lord that they neglect the people that God has called to begin to disciple their own children. So we begin at home. We don't stop there, but we at least begin at Jerusalem. And then he says to Judea and Samaria, that is our evil of influence. That would be our Dallas would be Fort Worth, that would be Texas, our immediate world. There are so many opportunities in our immediate world that we are in. I praise God that when we gave the challenge during Missions Conference that 40 people responded saying, I want to get involved in what's going on. You want to know how to get involved in your immediate world? Just look at your board. Right here it is. Pepsi Challenge. Help tutor one hour a week for a great cause. Pinkston High School in West Dallas is one of two schools chose to be, to be challenged. The students who finish school can get up to $2,000 in scholarships for college. Pinkston was chosen because NBC wanted to be involved. No special skills are required. Just help. You want to get involved in your immediate world? Here's a place to begin. Just volunteer. You don't need all kinds of special skills, but this is a beginning point in your immediate world. <coughs> Other thing, Luke's Plaza, Dallas Theological Seminary, they provide clothing and household needs of the students. We welcome donations of such items in clean and usable condition. There are so many ways that you and I can get involved in our immediate world, to build the lives of other people. You know what happened in the Church of Jerusalem? They were comfortable in Jerusalem. They liked it in Jerusalem. They 
wanted to retire in her own personal world of influence. In Acts chapter 8, we are told that God allowed persecution to come upon that church so that the people were scattered. And where did they go? According to the book of Acts chapter 8, it says they went to Judea and Samaria. Sometimes God has to rattle our cage. Sometimes he has to bring us to the place where we are so totally dependent upon him that that's when we begin to look up and say, God, what else do you have for me? You may be calling some of you right now. I want you to see your immediate world. There are people here in Dallas who need your attention. They need you to mentor them. They need you to come alongside them. They need to hear this good news about Jesus Christ. But then the Lord says, also go to the ends of the earth. I call that your distant world. Your distant world, I believe, is anything that is cross-cultural, anything that is distant to you, distant in language, distant in culture, distant in geography. And you know what is interesting? That distant world is coming here to Dallas. Now, we need to go out to the distant world, but I want you to know that a lot of that distant world is coming right here. You want to get involved with the distant world? One way of getting involved in the distant world is to find out what's going on. Perhaps some of you can take some short-term trips. Here's a Guatemala trip that's set. The next trip to Guatemala, May 5th through 12th. Opportunity there. Here's another one. No response. We still have 10 international students waiting for an American friend. That's all. An American friend. Do you want to be a friend to an international student? In the distant world that's coming to your doorstep, would you like to befriend that person? Just begin to make an appointment. Develop a relationship. There's so many opportunities. To get involved in our personal world, our immediate world, our distant world. Friend, you can make a disciple. You can do it because God will enable you. But you can only do it if you're willing to bear with us. You begin in your immediate household. You begin in your personal world. And then allow it to the immediate world and out into the distant The book of Acts was not written for the professional. The book of Acts is a book that is filled with laymen in the church who got serious with God. Laymen in the church who asked that the Spirit of God take control of their lives, that the Spirit of God move them out, mobilize them to touch people for Jesus Christ. I am convinced that God can do some great things right here in Dallas walls around the world, if we at Northwest Bible Church are willing to take it seriously. We can come here week after week, and listen to one sermon after another, and have one worship service after another, and go away and totally in change. Or we can begin to take God seriously. Friend, I want to be a part of a congregation that wants to take God seriously. I'm taking God seriously. God is telling me things through the Word. I'm not hearing voices. Don't get along. God is speaking to me through his word in ways that I've never had to do before. I'm asking God to make whatever the changes he needs to make in my attitude, in my perception, in my discernment, in my availability. I believe that God's going to do things in my life that he never would have done otherwise. Now that's scary. Because I'm the type of individual who likes to have things done sequentially, I have them done in order. I like to know the outcome. I like to have them organized. But I find that when the Spirit of God begins to move in your life, that doesn't mean that you have to be disorganized to be spiritual. But there are times you and I need to get out of our little cage and our little cubicle and say, all right, Spirit of God, just bear me on your wings and you move me out. I don't know what that means. But I'm available for you. Is that where you are this morning? Friend, if you will just come to that place in your life, I can guarantee you you're going to have the most exciting life. Because it won't just be a life of success, but it will be a life of great success. Lord God, we thank you so very much for your word that's quick and powerful and sharper than a truth soul. And Lord, sometimes when we hear your word, we 
are not as comfortable as we were before we heard. Because, Lord, you speak to our hearts. You speak to our wills. You challenge us to be what you want us to become. None of us are qualified to do that without being able to hear the Spirit. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will use this word to work in each of our lives, beginning with this past, and then moving out throughout the leadership, throughout the congregation, throughout the community. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Excuse me, for our benediction, let's stand and close by singing this chorus. And for us, we sing it from your heart.